Hello, and welcome to a more intelligent tomorrow. A wide-ranging exploration of the potential impact of AI on the world around us, as envisioned by the future heroes of the human and machine intelligence revolution. How long till the AI rocket has left the platform? We'll discuss this and more with Michael Kanan on today's episode. And now, your host, Ben Taylor. Hey, Michael Kanan. Thanks for making time for us and being on the show today. Really appreciate you making time. And you've got a book that you have coming out in August. And I'm excited for our listeners to find out about it. Yeah. Uh, listen, it's a pleasure to be with you, Ben, and really commend all of Data Robot's work on uh, these difficult you know, topics of our time, particularly in AI, but also really celebrating the work that everyone's doing in relation to COVID-19, combating the spread, predictive analytics, and doing so in a really apolitical, data-driven, really factual way. So so, you know, bravo and, and kudos to the whole team. And yeah, so Mike Kanan, uh, I have a book coming out on August 25th. It's called T minus AI. And, uh, you know, prior to, to, to this, I was a former co-chair of artificial intelligence for the U.S. Air Force and uh, currently up at MIT right now. Awesome. Let's dive in. What potential AI applications are the most exciting to you and what are the most terrifying right now? What are you going to wake up early in the morning to be working on or thinking about in the coming years right now? And then what keeps you up at night? Okay. Wakes me up early. Um, I I think we're all realizing how important our data is and how important, you know, that the ways in which it is used are, you know, okay with us. So when you have, you know, kind of like the the whole span of, you know, secure data that's protecting your privately identifiable information, you have three pieces. You have data at rest, you know, traditional encryption models, super safe sitting on some solid state drive somewhere, whatever, right? You have this data in transit thing, like moving across the cloud, making choices, right? The thing that inspires me most that I think is a really interesting topic to, that, that people should pursue is data and compute. So if the reality is, is that we're going to do more AI, which is definitely true, how do we send encrypted data or workloads over to a machine that remain encrypted, that outputs a model on that data, right? That means something to me. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting question that yeah. I think is, is really important in this entire process. Um, that there are a number of, you know, very small startups starting to work on this stuff. I think that's super cool. And I think it's so important right now is to make sure that when we're generating a model, that data isn't exposed. Yeah. Healthcare right now, a lot of um, hospitals won't share data in the U.S. for liability reasons. But what you just described, you can encrypt it all, send it up to a central server. Everyone benefits from the model and no data sets exposed. Um, so, okay. Yeah, something that's definitely needed, interesting, you know, technically interesting, doable. Uh, we don't have it today. Um, what keeps you up at night? What do you think about with AI where you, you kind of have pause or dread? Maybe something in the future that you hope will never come or something today that we're dealing with. That's why I wrote the book, you know, fear of being asleep at the wheel, right? Fear of not paying attention to changing times, not being open to new ways of doing business to new people's thoughts, to new inputs, to this concept of, of what is real that I think many of us are asking ourselves quite often lately. Is that real? I, I, that keeps me up at night. But the only way we can start addressing that is to have a better foundation of what these things are. So, you know, the ideas of computer generated content, you know, yeah. That's that's terrifying. Or to be asleep at the wheel while, um, you know, ideologically opposed forces grab market share that we don't have options on, that we're only stuck to that. I think I think that's what keeps me up at night. And then the most important thing is is really public education on the topic. Yeah, really, really just, you know. This generation has this opportunity to be at this huge inflection point, and we have to provide them the means and the resources to see the world how they want to see it. Maybe it is different than mine, but it's their world to be had. 
and they deserve the resources to do so and the education. So, you know, my fear is, is not thinking about it in that sense. You and I are meeting today because of Data Robot, and that brings up a question that I like to ask individuals that are building AI systems. How do you decide to build versus buy? That's a, that's That can be very challenging, especially for startups that are dealing with intellectual property. Do we need to build it to protect it? And so how do you, how do you uh, approach that, or what advice would you give to people that are trying to decide build versus buy when it comes to AI technology? The broad community of AI developers have looked at it as a due obligation to make these things publicly available. So one, you have to ask yourself the question, is this already available to me right now? And all I got to do is go to a GitHub repository and you know pull that out and extract it. And it's not an offering that requires IP. For the federal government, I think, you know, and we're talking very broadly, the federal government has an obligation to uh, procure commercially when commercially available, you know, from a U.S. code in 1994. And, you know, and that's the right thing to do, right? Absolutely. Realizing what's commercially available is a really important topic because it means that you have to be, you know, up to date with every single latest advance. I mean, the, the you know, level of diligence is is very difficult. Now, for companies, I think there are two things to think about. Well, maybe three. The first is, have I employed or provided the ability to upskill and and to provide education to my workforce who are passionate or inspired to go learn how to do these things internally? Because certainly that's much, you know, that's something that you want to have. Every company is a tech company. And back to this idea that it's not just, you know, coding and programming. The second, though, is I think it's really important to democratize access to basic AI solutions, right? You should be able to grab an Excel file and drag and drop it into a platform and choose a model that's, again, all publicly available and spit out an API that, you know, informs some decision. And there are plenty of, you know, like Data Robot who offer those things. And people should should judge that and figure it out. But, you know, building it in-house you have to ask yourself, is this a core offering that I'm going to have, you know, as as something I put out externally that, you know, necessitates IP because that's what our business is about. But if you're just doing it internally, I don't understand why you would, you know, look at, oh, I'm going to have to, you know, um, you know, build that myself when there's plenty of democratization of access to this going on. And I think from my perspective, I think of it as tuition and experience and who's paying for it. And so talking about uh, explainable AI or model drift or productionizing AI systems, if you're building it from scratch, who's going to pay, f- who's going to learn that experience? So who's going to have the first model that has an excursion? It goes off r- off the rails. I think a lot of times for people that haven't done this before, we think a static model is static and that it's true, but the features are not. And so you can get feature drift. And, and so I've personally been involved with excursions that impacted customers where it was feature drift two months later, stuff that was not on the radar. The data scientists weren't even considering that. And the model was static. And so, yeah, so experience is, is a huge part of the AI, the personal AI roadmap. How do you stay up to date? I mean, I personally live at Ar- on Archive, you know, being at MIT nowadays, is I feel like I'm always looking at whatever the latest advancement is, but that's because I think it's cool. And not everyone is going to be that way. I have a personally, you know, inspiring leader who always said to me, you have to pin the rose on somebody. You have to pin the rose on somebody to uh, evangelize a charge, right? To be, to inspire other people to pay attention to it. So the first thing is, is ask yourself in the organization, is there somebody whose like job is to stay up to date on these things? By the way, a full-time job, right? But then also, if the broader company or like organization is sees the world through AI, sees each of their individual businesses, whether I'm in like, you know, HR or the accounting department, then I can pay attention to the advancements in AI in my own field and then share them with other people and, you know, communicate at the water cooler about it. So I think the first thing is, Someone's got to be in charge. 
someone has to pay attention to the advancements and have a voice at the proverbial boardroom. And then the second is get your workforces inspired to use AI in their individual practices. Yeah, no, great, great answer. I that That's something that people feel intimidated with. And maybe it's for that reason, because they haven't they haven't pinned the rose on someone. They haven't committed to that approach. And so they're just scratching at the surface constantly and missing Bert and like all these big breakthroughs that are coming out and they're they're finding out because their competitors implemented it or or it's you know it's a year later, two years later. Does your book hit on autonomous war? Uh, yeah. Does it hit on Black Mirror? Yeah, I'm an ardent fan of science fiction. I think sci-fi writers have created, you know, the greatest works of our time that inspire our imaginations and ask us tough questions. I also think that it's created this idea of killer robots that like somehow is ingrained in society like Terminator and Hal and all of that jazz. Um, so yeah, I think on page seven or something, I, I, already, I cite like Black Mirror, Ex Machina, you know, Terminator, all of that stuff. So yeah, I, I discuss it. One of the topics I want to hit on selfishly is this topic of consciousness. So we talk about AI ethics and rights, and there, there are so many ways that AI can amplify good, but also amplify bad if we're not thinking about bias and racism. But do you think there is, do you think there will ever be a scenario in our lives where AI itself gets its own rights, where me kidnapping your droid and taking it to the shredder I'll be in trouble for more than just property damage. Do we have to reimagine, you know, how current laws and understanding of, of things work? I, I think it's really like fascinating. I've never really thought about it that when we talked about data being experience, right? Data for a computer is experience to us. And these things are really merging right now, right? They're one in the same. If I had a drone that followed me around all day, Mm -hmm. and took pictures of me and my family and someone destroys that well the first question i'd ask is well what are the laws in place for you know property loss damage and also you know the side pieces of of you know trauma and everything else when somebody you know cr pr put arson against my home and burned up all my pictures or my old vhs tapes yeah right so i think so again that's kind of like the techniques of the old now let's shift it over to this conversation and then pull the string back to say, okay, does the current understanding still work for AI, right? Does it still matter? And if so, all is gravy, but if not, then let's have a willingness to change. This has been a great conversation by the, by the way, really, really fascinating. And I think for the listeners, definitely check out your book. Um, so, so how can they find their, how can they find your book? Is it on Amazon? What's the best way for them to go? Is it on Audible as well? What What's the release look like? Yeah, the release is on August 25th. It'll be on Audible. It's on Amazon as we speak right now. Pre-orders are, you know, super important to authors. You know, surprise yourself on, on release day without having to go to the store. It'll be in all of the traditional Barnes & Noble and everything else. Um, and then following me on, uh, I, I feel like we're very public, you know, on Twitter and Instagram and everything else talking about this stuff right now. So yeah, and that's and that's what's most important. Transparency is key. Uh, so you can find it on all the usual places you'd imagine. Also, bookshop.org. You know, plug here. Support local bookstores. They mean so much to communities, right? Buy from there because you know a, a piece of those proceeds or a piece of the buy goes back to the local bookstore of your choice. So buy local because local bookstores mean a ton to local communities. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm really looking forward to downloading your Audible. Take it on some bike rides. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been a pleasure having you. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Such a pleasure.